Awesome. So thanks, everyone, for joining us, and welcome to Introduction to Fundraising. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time. I know September is quite busy for everyone, and we are really excited to host this crash course uh, in fundraising as part of our integral intro series, where we give overviews of key areas of nonprofit management that Integra Org specializes in. Uh, my name is Liz Tang. I use the pronoun she, her, and I'm the program coordinator and education coordinator for Integral Org. I'll be in the background hosting and monitoring the chat. And so without any further ado, let's hop right into our land acknowledgement. Um, right. We acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the ancestral and uh, traditional territory of many peoples presently subjects to treaties 6, 4, 7, 8, and 10, namely the Black Cut Blackfoot Confederacy, the Gaina, Bagani, Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Sutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. This includes the Métis settlements and the six regions of the Métis Nation of Alberta within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. And we are so grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. Um, so very pleased to introduce our facilitator for today. This is Derek Bechthold, certified fundraising executive, uh, whose career spanning 24 years has had him the honor of contributing to a myriad of nonprofits and charities from a multitude of sectors, including, but very much not limited to, Woods Homes, Can Learn Society, In From the Cold, and currently the Brenda Strafford Foundation. And so these agencies have ranged in budgets from 500K to 85 million and fundraising departments from seven full-time employees to one-person shops. Um, and so over his uh, extensive career, Derek has dabbled in every manner of fund development, annual giving, major gifts, special events, uh, through to planned giving, and is very well versed in that uh, high level strategic development and down to the tactical minutiae of fundraising, as he likes to put it. So, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, yeah, and hope you enjoy. Well, fantastic. Thank you so very much. Um, really appreciate that introduction, uh, Liz. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today for this um, uh, introduction to fundraising, uh, sort of a 101. Uh, just sort of looking at a bit of an um, overview of what we're going to be uh, sort of looking at today. Uh, fundraising trends. We need to sort of see, get a good sense of what is happening out there in the nonprofit sector. Um, sort of sink our teeth into some uh, numbers and some stats there. And then we'll say, okay, with these learnings, how do we now sort of adapt and, and, and how do we engage in fundraising? Uh, so that's where we dip into the fundraising 101. We'll look at some return on investment uh, for the various different mediums of fundraising. Uh, we'll then start to segue into the ask, the, the who's, the when's, the how's, and all those wonderful things about the ask. Um, and then we'll also start to look at uh, stewardship. That's personally my favorite part. Uh, it is sort of a, a mix of an art and a science. Uh, and then we'll sort of start to uh, cap off at the end for tools, tools to enhance your, uh, your fundraising shop. So as I mentioned, the very first thing that we sort of need to do is look at our industry. What, 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 is, the, uh, what is the field that we're sort of currently playing in? I think it's good to look at some of the, uh, some of the myths and misconceptions uh, about the nonprofit sector um, and, and, you know, sort of try and debunk these if we can. So um, myth number one. And we'll see if some people have 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 heard these. Um, we do good work in the sector, right? All of us do good work in the sector. Uh, we're all unique and we're all different, right? No, not not at all. There is a gaggle of us out there. Uh, there are over 170,000 charitable uh, and nonprofit organizations in Canada. Uh, 85,000 of those are registered charities. Um, while this slide is a little bit dated, uh, the ratios still maintain. Uh, so between uh, 03 and 18, while our population grew 39%, uh, the number of nonprofits almost equaled that at, at 35%. So there, there is a lot of competition that is going on out there. Myth number two, 
people want to support us. Yes, because we do good work, as we just said. So people naturally want to support us. There has to be enough dollars to go around, right? Again, no, that is not uh, correct. Um, what we're starting to see now is a very have versus have not uh, playing field. Uh, if you have not downloaded uh, Canada Helps Giving Report 2023, please do. Must reading, must reading uh, for uh, for the nonprofit sector. Um, what we're looking at is about 86% of the uh, the charities, okay, Canada wide, uh, bring in about 23% of fundraising revenue. Conversely, you're looking at about 13% of the charities bringing in 76% of the fundraising revenue in total. Uh, so of course you're looking at some of the big boys there, right? You're looking at hospitals, you're looking at uh, some of the registered churches, um, you're looking at very, very large foundations, right? Um, also, according to the giving report, 78% um, of charities uh, make up less than 500 grand uh, in revenue a year. 90% uh, of them uh, employ 10 or fewer uh, full-time staff and 58% are fully run by uh, by volunteers. Uh, looking at sort of the, the, the registration for this uh, for this awesome course today, I, <laughs> there's no question that some of you guys are in that are in that pool. No question. Myth number three, hey, once our donors are on board, they're going to love us, right? We do good work. They got lots of money. They, they they're going to continue to give to us, right? No, that is simply not the case. Uh, donor retention is simply a measure of how many donors will continue to donate to your organization over a span of time. Uh, as we can see, these numbers have been sort of decreasing for the last few years. Uh, clearly, <laughs> so here is the issue. Uh, nonprofits with a low donor retention rate will need to continually acquire new donors to maintain their level, to maintain their giving level. So please put in the back of your mind, new donor acquisition. We'll sort of come back to this in, in a second here. Um, myth number four, and oh, good gravy, I've heard this one a lot. Uh, we gotta go after corporations, yeah? They are loaded and they love to give away just the oodles of money. Um, again, that is, that, is, that is incorrect and inaccurate. Uh, this slide is very, very dated. This is the National Survey of Nonprofit Voluntary Organizations, but the ratios still maintain, and it was just such a fantastic survey that came out. Um, as we can clearly see, it is individuals, right, that do give the most. Obviously, you have your government agencies, municipal, uh, provincial, federal. Earned income, that can be things such as uh, performance um, uh, fees, admissions, uh, training materials, um, uh, Girl Scouts, I'm sure a large sliver in there are for um, uh, Girl Guide uh, cookies <clears throat> that the presenter may or may not be buying. Uh, so purely from a fundraising point of view, you can see it is individuals, it is individuals that we want to try and target our energy on. Myth number five, this younger generation Boy, they are savvy, right? Socially, they are very, very savvy. Uh, they are super engaged and they love to give, right? Not necessarily. Again, from Canada Helps, their fantastic giving report. Um, it is the Canadians aged 55 or older that, that give at twice the rate of younger Canadians. And it doesn't seem like our older generations are sort of being replaced at all. Um, further between uh, 07, in 2017, uh, the share of tax filers uh, who actually made donations according to uh, CRA dropped 5% from 24% to 19%. I think in terms of just the overall view of the nonprofit sector and fundraising, uh, I think this is a fantastic quote by the President and CEO of Canada Helps. Um, that we need to sort of do meaningful and intentional changes, right? The same old, same old, just ain't gonna cut it any longer. All that being said, right? Uh, we've sort of said all this, it is doom and gloom. So, hey, we might as well just kind of all throw up our hands and just kind of go away and give up. No, no, please don't. <laughs> uh, I, I think there are a number of tools and strategies that we can adopt 
uh, that can sort of aid us in our fundraising endeavors. Um, and let's let's sort of look at uh, look at some of those. So, what is it that we can do in 2023 uh, and and beyond? Well, so as we can sort of see here, uh, these are sort of four kind of main areas really that your shop should, should sort of maybe pay attention to: people, revenue, mission and operations, and empowering technology and data. That's great. So, so what the heck does that actually mean? So, if we talk in terms of people. Donor retention. Donor retention is key. Try to understand your donors and have them come back again and again. And that is through exemplary stewardship. Revenue. Okay, diversification. Again, well, what does that mean? Try different things and don't just stick to the same old, same old that may be failing yet again and again. When we say our mission and our operations and giving donors something uh, that they can feel good about, that is showing impact. Right, and that can be showing impact whether it is through stories or whether it is through metrics uh, and data. Show impact to your donors, and then finally, empowering of, of uh, technology. <sighs> maximize online, please, please, please do everything you can to maximize online. But then also internally for your own shops, get a good database that will help you through your fundraising endeavors. And we'll sort of start to come back to some of those. So before we start to, start to look at some of the, the fundraising that you can kind of begin to, uh, to sort of analyze and adopt at your shop, let's look at some of the uh, return on investments for some of the mediums. Um, now, while this data is really quite old from um, AFP, Association of Fundraising Professionals, again, the ratios still hold true. Um, <laughs> it, it's funny, I, I recently uh, wrote my CFRE uh, exam this past May, uh, and this was still on there as a, as a question. There may be a few things on here that really might be almost sort of jaw dropping for some people. Uh, you probably heard from everybody. Oh my God, we've got to have events. Oh, please have another golf tournament. Please have a gala. It will cost you 50 cents to raise $1, right? Remember we were talking about donor retention versus donor acquisition, right? In terms of actually acquiring a brand spanking new donor, it'll cost you between a dollar and a dollar fifty to bring on that new donor. Whereas to retain that donor that you already got in your system, wow, that's only going to be twenty to twenty five percent or twenty to twenty five cents to raise that dollar. Clearly, though, grant writing and major gifts and some capital campaigns that seems to be kind of where that sweet spot is. And and ROI is certainly something you want to look at. If you are a small shop and if you're the, you know, the, the chief cook and bottle washer, ROI and management of your time is going to be critical. So this, this is a fascinating, and I love this, <laughs> this diagram. Uh, fundraising used to very, very much be a 80-20 uh, rule or a, um, the parallel rule, uh, parallel principle, sorry. Um, it, ultimately, it states that, um, uh, that for a, uh, any many outcomes, roughly 80% of the consequences are derived from 20% of the causes. Okay. What this slide really sort of shows is that your low to mid-level donors, which generally make up about 95% uh, of your donor base, will only yield about 5% of the gifts that you will actualize. Conversely, <laughs> The top 5% of your donors, right? Your major donors. So think about some of those really, really influential, um, generous donors at your shop, whether that's 50 grand or 500 or 5,000, whatever. They will, that 5% will give the bulk of your overall fundraising revenue, right? So, so this 80 20 rule, it's now becoming more like <laughs> 95 5. Uh, so if we start to sort of analyze all this, if we think about sort of the, um, the, the, the myths that we kind of went through and dispelled, uh, and if we sort of look at uh, what some of the ROI is, right, and, and, and what are some of the different mediums that we may want to engage in, we can start to see a, a, a bit of a clear picture here that you may want to focus some of your energy and effort on individuals, right, uh, major gifts, and grants, right? These might certainly be those avenues that you can start to look at at your shop. Okay, 
uh, let's start to look at uh, the asks. And and first, let's let's look at well, who who is it exactly that we can we can ask? Well, we're let's analyze individuals, right? I mean, that's the one that we're sort of talking about here over the last few slides. Derek, I can't find them. I we don't know anybody. Well, no, that that's not true. What you want to do is look to those that are closest and dearest to your organization first, right? Have you asked your board members? Have you asked your, your volunteers, your staff members? Every organization I've worked at, I have donated to. Um, my, my personal view being, I cannot ask for money unless I've given money. So that's just my personal view. Uh, close stakeholders or even connections through longstanding donors, right? There are numerous different segments that you can start to analyze that are close to your organization and kind of work out in terms of proximity. When we look at grants, and this is this is often an interesting one because people love to sort of write grants, but they often sort of say, okay, I'm not quite sure where or how to find grants. And, and it's, a, it's a great question. It, don't just think about sort of foundations and corporations, please. Uh, you can look at sort of government and pseudo government, right? So community initiatives program uh, or CFAP, Community Facility Enhancement Program uh, through the government of Alberta. Those are great places to start. Also, please, please, please look at service clubs. Uh, there have to be in Calgary, oh, Christmas cracker. We're looking at probably 20, 30 service clubs alone. Um, right now, I am uh, I work out of Tudor Manor uh, for the Brenda Stratford Foundation. That's in Okotoks. When you drive in, you have that sign, Rotary, Lions, Kinsmen, right? Uh, certainly touch base with them and try and tap into those uh, service clubs. Uh, if you're sort of starting fresh, there are uh, a couple of paid services that you can look at. Uh, Grant Connect, uh, Big Online, uh, these things that through a subscription, uh, they will in a very, very fancy way, punt out just a number of different sort of grants based upon uh, your sector and whom you serve and these types of things. I had at another organization, a volunteer, uh, and she had loads of time, nothing but time. She went through CRA and Charities Directory, okay? And she did a search for uh, private foundations and public foundations. And she found 1,174 foundations in Alberta. Not all of them are gonna give, not all of them will give to you, if you've got that volunteer that's looking to do something, that's fantastic data mining potential and it doesn't cost a dime, right? So there are some avenues to sort of look at. And of course, corporations, right? Yes, I list, I list the big boys here, but oh my gosh, please look at through your um, chamber of commerce, some of the smaller mom and pop shops, right? That are just itching to get their name out there that are very, very community oriented and really sort of want to be engaged. This one is an interesting one. This is more of not an actual sort of who should you ask, but almost kind of a, a medium as well. Third party events. Um, this isn't sort of your, your, your golf tournaments and galas that you put, your, you put on yourself, but rather, do you know of a corporation that is putting on a stampede party, say if you're in Calgary? Uh, or do you know, know an organization that's putting on a wine and cheese for Christmas and they're doing a collection? Right? Maybe you're a small food bank, uh, you know, in, 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 a, uh, in a town in uh, rural Alberta. Uh, try and hook up with these corporations. They're often now looking at more and more ways to engage your staff on a deeper, meaningful level. Right. And, and the, the ROI on third party events are quite, quite high. As I was saying before, what you want to do is look at those that are closest to your organization. They know you inside and out. Uh, they, they, they have a love for you, a passion. Uh, they're dedicated to you. It takes very, very little convincing to bring them further on board to make a meaningful gift or a contribution to you. Uh, this is Rosso's uh, concentric circle um, circles. Um, Henry Rosso was, was sort of the godfather of, 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 of fundraising. Uh, and and he, he came up with these circles just in terms of those that you should literally target first in your fundraising endeavors. So try and keep this try and keep this in mind. 
Okay, so we've gone through a gaggle of uh, of the who's, right? And 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 let's now actually maybe start to look at uh, when when can we sort of ask some of these? And and you know, please make sure that you prioritize. Do not take on everything all at once. Take a very very strategic view. Step back. And, and, and set very, very realistic bite-sized goals for yourself and for your organization, okay? What I do personally <laughs> at every shop I've been in, especially the smaller ones, is I try and make a yearly calendar of grant dates. Um, so you want to sort of see when some of your grants are due, right? So ABC Foundation, they're due in, in January. Wow, okay, the DEF Foundation, they're due in September. Fantastic. Place these sort of in. Those are things that will not move. Those will not move. And you can then start to build in and around them. Further, throw in your golf tournament. Say you do have one. We at the Brenda Stratford Foundation, we just had one um, the 14th. Sorry, I think I'm still, there's a little P, uh, PTSD, so I'm still recovering from it. So yes, we just had our golf tournament, all right? Work around that. When are you also going to do sort of a mail-out campaign? You can also put in there, this is when I can then hit up, say, service clubs, or this is when I can now start to prospect for individuals. Please, please, please also try to build in things um, that are more uh, in, in initiatives that are national observances, recognition, that type of thing. Family uh, Violence uh, Prevention Month is November, right? Uh, for us, Seniors Week is uh, in June. Um, you know, do you have a specific uh, theme in your social service industry or whatever industry it is that can fit or that can literally piggyback on some national observance? That might be something literally to sort of leverage and make your asks upon as well. There is also ongoing and passive fundraising. And this is really, really kind of nifty. Um, there are more and more avenues that you can place sort of online uh, for people to donate. So it's no longer just, hi, please submit a check to us, or here's cash. Then move to, oh, yes, make a donation online. Well, we're now starting to look at, you know, you donate a car, right? You can skip the depot and you can donate uh, through them. Uh, the nice, big, fancy green R, that's Rafflebox, incredibly popular, where with Rafflebox, you can set up, you can do monthly 50-50 draws. Hugely popular. And there's some nonprofits that are really just making a killing off those. The point is, though, provide different avenues for your donors to contribute. Okay, so we looked at sort of the who's and we kind of looked at uh, kind of the wins. And, and, and now let's just sort of briefly look at the hows. This one is really quite intricate, but we'll try and sort of delve into it just a, 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 a little bit. Preparation. Preparation is key. Um, this is a, a, a moniker that's sort of popular in around fundraising. When you are making an ask, make sure that you have the right person asking the right prospect, or that is, you know, the individual that you're asking for money, for the right project that you're really trying to sell or engage them with at that right time. Remember, we're talking about prioritizing and for the right amount. Make sure that you have all of these things in play as you are about to go out and ask. That also falls in with grants as well. So it doesn't just have to be individual asks, that can be grants as well. When you are chatting with an individual or a corporation or a foundation, right? Please make sure that you listen to the ask. Oh, okay, that's all fancy. What the heck does that mean? That means that you want to seek more information from them. You want to learn what's important from them. What is it that they are looking for to fulfill their philanthropic dreams, right? You want to try and achieve those. And then you sort of pipe in, wow, that sounds absolutely fantastic. You know what? I think we've got a great synergy with this, right? I've heard an interesting uh, quote, uh, we're born with uh, two ears and one mouth. Let's stick with that ratio. Right. So uh, and make sure, please, that you come armed with um, your toolbox really quite overflow with. So facts, figures, numbers, right. Uh, impacts and outcomes, stories, emotion, all those sorts of things that will cater to that donor and what they are requiring. 
So say you've gone through all this, whether it is uh, you've heard back from a uh, foundation or a corporation, uh, or you've chatted with an individual donor, uh, please, 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 in the aftermath, thank them, regardless of, of, of the outcomes. Um, also, be kind and gentle on yourself. Manage expectations with yourself. You will receive no's. I cannot even tell you how many no's I've received. Uh, I know that doesn't sound <clears throat> good for me, but let me tell you that there is a, a truckload of no's. But I think what, what is what is good is that in every ask, whether it's a yes or a no, uh, there can be a learning moment uh, from this. So say you have actually secured, right? You've actually sort of secured a grant. Bravo, that is fantastic. We have a little sort of uh, inflatable squeaky uh, toy here for dogs. It's a little donut and I go around and I kind of squeak it. It's terribly annoying, but it's ever so much fun. Celebrate when you get a, a grant. So this is part of the thanking, right? The stewardship. Um, I think it's far more important than the asking and you can't properly ask for money unless you can properly thank people for money. Uh, AFP puts out a fundraising effect in this report and this is really, really quite interesting. Um, why do people stop giving? <laughs> so not only were they sort of not shown uh, the impact or what their donation went to, also they were sometimes asked too much. So that's where you get sort of that um, uh, donor fatigue coming in. They weren't thanked, right? So, so, so you know, consider yourself, you know, me, I, I say I give $25 to uh, Save the Weasel Foundation of South Calgary, you know, small but vibrant uh, foundation, not a real one, but I always use it. Uh, I, I want to be thanked. I just want to be thanked for that. So think of your donation of where you've given generously. You love receiving that thank you. It is important and it matters to people, okay? Now, what is it that a small agency can do here? And this goes into our retention. Remember we saw some of those stats on, on donor retention versus acquisition, right? Um, what I have found, and this is where I think a smaller shop is certainly very, very well equipped to do, is that you guys are very, very nimble, and very, very flexible, and very responsive. So you can draft up thank you cards or, or just literally get on the horn and phone somebody else. You may know them because you come from a small rural uh, area. Tours, these types of things, um, I, I think, are just all wins. Uh, I know that in some of the larger shops that I've been at, if you're going to sort of send out a thank you, it has to actually be vetted by a few people. There is nothing more, I think there's nothing more meaningful than someone getting a handwritten thank you card on an envelope that was handwritten with a sticky stamp, not through the machine. That, to me, that shows caring and that shows incredible stewardship. Also for your stewardship, I think it is important to sort of <clears throat> look at now, you, what are some of the tools that we can now kind of bring in? Okay, so we, we, we've looked at, uh, we've looked at our asks and sort of when and how and who and all those sorts of things. And we've talked about the thank yous. Let's look at tools that you should and can use at your shop that will really make your life so much easier. Please, please, please have a case for support. The definition of it from AFP, is right there. On your right hand side is really kind of <laughs> the interpretation of that. Some case for supports, if you type that in on Google, you'll find these huge immaculate long things. It can really just sort of be a two pager that really kind of sums up in a very, very nice, concise, emotional, meaningful way that your needs and why your organization merits support, right? This should be handy anytime you meet someone, donor, corporation, foundation, whomever it could be. Program budgets. This one is an interesting one. And not, not everybody's, there's a number of agencies I've, I've been at that, that really sort of don't understand this. So I'll try to sort of explain it. Um, we do good work and our budget is $500,000 and we just sort of feed people. And that's kind of what we do. That sometimes for a funder, it is difficult to, difficult to sort of conceptualize, right? Like I, I don't sort of get that. What does this 500,000 go towards? If you can break it down into juicy morsels for someone that they can literally uh, sink their teeth into, that will be far more favorable. So find within your shop 
you know, these small little avenues that you do, these small little programs, and it could be, say, 50,000, 60,000. It's a smaller shop and it might only be 5,000, right? Attach sort of a budget to that. All of these should therefore make up your organization's budget. I like to see it as sort of a, a, a jigsaw, kind of a jigsaw puzzle for myself. So uh, if you say have a $100,000 work, right? You have program X that's 20,000, you have program Y that's 30, and, and, and program Z that's 50,000. That should make up your 100,000. Okay, well, Derek, well, what, what do you sort of throw in there? I throw everything I can because you want to have a true reflection of what that program is. It requires some of your executive director to oversee or to manage or to report upon. It requires some, maybe you're leasing out the space. Certainly there has to be uh, facility costs, right? All of these things go into making up a program. Unfortunately, sometimes what we get caught in is, is this realm where, oh, all that I have uh, is, is material costs. Yes, I just need desks. No, people. It is people that run programs. Ensure that you reflect this in your budgets appropriately, please. Ooh, this slide, there is so much to unpack here, and I don't even really... <laughs> I don't even really quite know where to sort of uh, begin. I think, I think for uh, the, your CRM or your donor database, this is probably one of the most valuable tools that you can have. And I'm starting to learn this more and more. Um, I've been at agencies where they see a CRM or your donor database as simply a, a, a method to spit out tax receipts. No, it is not. It is not an accounting tool. No, it is, isn't just for your bean counters at all. Please know it is a measure. It is a means to capture your entire history, the essence of this donor. It should track in uh, some of their interests. It can have in some of their hobbies, uh, important dates or things or issues that, that are very, very relevant to them. Anything that can sort of help this donor so that you can understand them a little bit better, right? A good database and good information in your database will also really help your ROI. Now, what I mean by that is that 80-20 rule, right? Are we spending the right amount of time on the right amount of people, right? Uh, or on the right people, sorry. And, and with a good database that has all of this information in it, you will therefore be able to segment out your major donors and therefore spend that, that critical time on them to steward them, to nurture them, and to make you know, another ask. Where can I get a CRM, Derek? Glad you asked. Um, there are a few that are out there that are um, quite, quite cheap. Uh, I know that Canada Helps has one, I believe, um, Salesforce. They are big and burly, true. Um, and they do require a lot of sort of uh, IT uh, wherewithal at your shop. Uh, however, uh, at a previous gig where I was at, it was free and they offer 10 free licenses. Something to consider, right? If you are a member of TechSoup, a fantastic sort of umbrella uh, organization that provides uh, uh, technology essentials for uh, nonprofits, uh, in Canada, I think they're in the States as well, but in, in Canada's the only one I've looked at. They do have a few CRMs that are uh, involved with them. And in fact, ours here at uh, Brandon Stratford Foundation is Donor Perfect. And you can get them for a smoking deal, right? I, 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 I challenge you to look at these and, and please don't just have your database in Word or uh, you know some sort of you know mutated form of access or an Excel spreadsheet. Those are good. And those will work in a pinch, absolutely, and I get it. But you want to have a good database to ensure that you are sustainable in your fundraising endeavors. Okay, so what does kind of all of this sort of mean? So that was just a, 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 like a, a plethora of, of neat and nifty things that we kind of went through. Please, when you're, when you're looking at your fundraising program, I, it wasn't built in a day. This takes a process. This takes time. I've been here at uh, BSF, Brent Stratford Foundation, for 
oh, Christmas cracker. It's coming up now um, two years. Yeah. I'm still working on stuff. I'm still morphing and still learning and still adapting and still changing. Rome wasn't built in a day and, and your fundraising program, it ain't going to be built in a day either. Okay. This one, I absolutely love, love, love this, uh, this quote. Um, this is from uh, originally uh, from uh, Peter Drucker, who is sort of the uh, godfather of, uh, of nonprofits. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, it is fantastic that you have all of these sort of strategic plans and uh, annual operating plans and all these sort of different plans and strategies. I agree. When you are picking a fundraising initiative or developing your fundraising program, please ensure that it fits within your organizational culture. Come in and look what has been happening with your organization first. If you're trying to fit a circle into a square, that ain't going to work out none too good, okay? Uh, and you're just going to get sort of more resistance. So definitely ensure that whatever it is that you adopt, that it fits within the culture of your organization, okay? And, and when you are picking a fundraising uh, initiative, oh, please, Christmas cracker, please measure it. Um, so, so we just had our golf tournament last week and we had seven, seven or eight activities on different holes. Uh, and we literally had a breakdown uh, in terms of uh, hole six. We had the marshmallow drive. Okay, how much did we yield from that? How many people were involved? Uh, yeah, at, at number, uh, at hole, uh, you know, 12, we had the cone advantage and how many people engaged in that? How many, da, da, da. Make sure that you are tracking all of this. Track the number of grants that go out. Track the number that are accepted and also the number that are not accepted. Measure this. Always measure it so that you are always trying to better yourself and change and adapt and improvise. And when you fail, oh, and this is me, and I fail often, trust me, please fail forward. So learn from it, right? And this, this is really also, I think, where the um, uh, the measuring sort of comes in. You know, so we'll, we'll sort of look at some of our activities. And I, I can tell you right now, no, we ain't going to be doing them next year. We're, we're just not because they just didn't yield what we wanted. So therefore, we're going to adapt from that and we're going to try something different. So if you do fail, you will, please fail for it. Okay. Um, and, and, and when you do succeed, um, some of you may not have a, a, a squeezy donut, uh, and that's okay. Um, I should really bring that in. I should, I should show you guys, but another time, uh, please celebrate, please, uh, pat yourself on the back for what you've done. Uh, fundraising in easy gig. Oh, when you do land that or you do connect with that donor, there's nothing more miraculous. That synergy is absolutely exemplary. Uh, so please, please make sure that you um, you celebrate. And gosh, I think that sort of is the end of uh, of us there. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that was yeah. Uh, that was speedy. Thank you, Derek, um, for imparting. All that expertise. Uh, I know when I was looking at the registration, uh, fundraising can be daunting and a lot of people are coming into it seeking any sort of advice. So um, I will just remind folks that I am going to be emailing out uh, a recording of this session as well as a few other resources, but um, I'm kind of taking this little time to mention what our next steps are before we get into Q&A. Um, so yeah, if you enjoyed today's session or interested in other funding topics, please do submit your feedback through our evaluation survey. And I'm just dropping a uh, several links in the chat right now. Um, so yeah, we know that many of you here today are new to fundraising. Um, we had questions like, how do I go about fundraising events to get the best bang for my buck? That was literally a question from our registration. Um, and just generally how most effectively to do fundraising. So we created a workshop. Uh, to walk through those big picture questions like how do I consider what type of event 
best fits my organization, my mission, my vision, um, answering questions like what's my general return on investment of fundraising events, um, and uh, what sorts of things should I consider when determining my event budget, to what sort of costs might be missed. So, um, and I know we got questions even now about uh, specific fundraising events. So um, this workshop does have a sliding scale ticket pricing model, um, and you can sign up for this event in the same way you signed up for uh, today. Um, yeah. And uh, if you haven't heard already, we have been working hard to launch our elevated leadership. This is a six months intensive leadership experience, um, and it does have a cohort model. So not only is it designed by us uh, from the nonprofit sector, but those participating in the program might come away or will come away with a group of nonprofit leaders that will support each other beyond the experience. So um, you can learn more about this opportunity from our website, or you can email me directly and I'll set you up with the right information. So uh, yeah, let's get into question time. Um, first, I'll start off with some from registration. Um, I thought it would be nice. I know we kind of addressed this at the beginning uh, today, but just at a high level, do you see, uh, Derek, if there's sufficient funding available for all the nonprofits and charities currently in the sector? Oh, sweet fancy Moses. That's a rigged question. I know. Um, <laughs> gosh. Um, no. No, there is not. Mm -hmm. uh, as we sort of saw uh, in some of the slides is that if we are decreasing in terms of donation rates, uh, donor retention is down and continually trends that way. Um, and the next generation is not giving at the same uh, fever or pitch or emotion as the older generation. So no, there is not, uh, there isn't enough funds to go around. Therefore, you know, it, it, it's imperative that we improvise, adapt, and overcome, right? Uh, so that looks like uh, partnerships. That looks like synergies out in there. Uh, I mean, you saw how many um, charities we have roaming around out there, and they are all, yes, they are doing absolutely fantastic stuff. Is there duplication? I think there probably is. No, I've seen it. I've been part of agencies that have duplicated others, Um so how can you sort of bring those together to try and move the needle further on some of these uh, critical social uh, social issues that we have? Um, I, I think that's one avenue, uh, and that's from a larger sort of nonprofit lens. Uh, I think from a fundraising, strictly so from my personal lens, uh, again, it, it's, it's therefore what kind of sets you unique for your tribe. So I'm going to use you know, Simon or not Simon Sinek, um, uh, oh my gosh, um, who speaks about tribes all the time? I don't know. I've uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know who I'm, I'm speaking of. Oh, Christmas cracker. Um, so you want to certainly you know, cater to those individuals and make sure that you retain them and have them coming back year after year and, and, and don't go after where funding is not or where funding is starting to dry up. Right, but rather go after those individuals, not those bright, shiny corporations. Um, uh, Seth, Seth mm -hmm. Godin, yes, there oh, we are, okay. or for your tribe, yes. Thank um, you. But yeah, so I think those are, there's sort of the two angles. There's from the nonprofit side, right? Collaborations, synergies. How is it that you can sort of come together to move the needle on these issues, and then also from that fundraising lens. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. This is a question that I wanted to take further than the literal question that was asked, but um, the original question was how effective are fundraising activities that target employees? So for example, 50-50s, wine and weekend trip draws. Um, but I know when we were working on our uh, upcoming workshop, it's hard to pin down the ROI of those specific activities, but I wanted your thoughts generally. Um, how have you found fundraising uh, that targets employees? How, how does that go? Are there different stewardship mm. practices when targeting oh. internally? Yeah. Wow, that is an excellent question. Um, and this really comes back to what is the culture of your organization? So I've worked at an organization uh, that was unionized and uh, you had to be very careful how you asked uh, for cash uh, from uh, from employees there. Um, I've also been uh, part of an agency uh, that uh, was a United Way uh, agency, and 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 there is you know they, they sort of see it as that greater 
philanthropy where, yes, you try and fundraise, you know, to sort of help out kind of the United Way. Uh, so the culture is a little different there. I've been at a small shop. Uh, it was $2.5 million uh, organization, smaller-ish, I guess. Um, and, oh, we had employee giving. I would say it was probably about 35 40%. Mm. Uh, it really, really quite good, right? Um, so ROI, again, that there's so many X, fa- X factors involved, especially regarding uh, what is the culture at your organization. If you're a small, tiny shop that's made up of mostly volunteers, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, uh, that, well, they're not staff, but that will certainly be, um, uh, if, I wouldn't say easier, but it, you'll certainly have a greater sort of field or, you know, a greater pool to sort of play from uh, that will be engaged in that. That's a, that's a great question though. That's a tough one. And it, like I said, it covers the spectrum, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Sorry. Just trying to gather all the questions that have been asked. Um, How effective uh, do you think in your experience is online fundraising? So some folks want to embrace it um, as it appears to be successful in the manner in which it's being promoted. You know, we're living so much more online, um, but are we being fooled? Is it, is it the next thing? What's your take on online fundraising? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, yes. Everybody in their dog will say, uh, yep, online, online, online. You have to have a presence. You, you must, right? You'll be conspicuous by your absence. Uh However, that being said, where I work, right, uh, the major of the largest um, component of our mission is uh, aging care and seniors living. We get mostly checks. And in fact, we get mostly cash during Christmas time. Right. Uh, You know, I will have uh, Betty Sue, you know, sort of uh, come up to the, you know, in a wheelchair up to my door and and rattle on the door sort of thing and and pass me a, a check. And that's ever so lovely and kind. That ain't online. Um, and I'll actually take a lot over the phone as well. So I think it really depends on what is your, your donor base, right? Who, who is it that you are sort of working with? Uh, if it is, uh, you see that your demographics are on the younger sort of side, there is no question that I would certainly be on that medium. Uh, I'd also be more engaged in, um, some of the different social media handles, right? Uh, heck, I even know some, um, uh, charities that are using TikTok, right? That sort of thing on uh, uh, in in terms of fundraising, right? Um, whereas I know come this Christmas time, yep, I'm going to have my nice little, uh, you know, tree out here and, and, and I will have the Betty Sue's come by and I will take phone calls, right? So uh, yes, online, you must be there. No question. Mm-hmm. But also what type is your organization? To whom mm. do you cater? Uh, what's your donor base? Uh, that's a good, that's a nuanced answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I answered it, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, this was a question. Um, I thought grants were geared more towards charities. Are there many grant opportunities for nonprofits? I'm sorry if this is too specific of a question, but uh, Ooh, throwing it out there. Nope. That's, uh, that is excellent. That is excellent. Um, yes, most, most grants are um they do cater to uh to charitable organizations uh there are some that can give to nonprofits i know that service clubs as well can give to nonprofits i believe and i i i apologize but there has been new legislation that has come out in terms of disbursement quotas for foundations for funders and can they give to nonprofits as well? So not just charitable organizations. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact uh, information on that. Um, but yes, there. You make sure you read the fine print. I know that for some of the pseudo government, like CIP, Community Initiatives Program, or CFAP, uh, Community Facility Enhancement Program through the Alberta government, they will uh, grant funds to nonprofits not just to register charities. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, there's a, people are asking very long questions, but we really do appreciate <laughs> it. Um, so this one was, um, you mentioned the 1,000 plus provincial funding foundations in Alberta, um, and they do preface with my question maybe too general to answer, but can you 
comment on applying to those uh, provincial funding foundations versus the national foundations. Is there a difference? Do you take a different strategy, rates of success, etc.? cetera? Oof. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. Um, I find that mostly, uh, so you can have small, small grassroots foundations uh, like the Ed Stelmac uh, Great Foundation, uh, Community Foundation, actually, and they cater to more of the small, small to medium sized agency. Um, uh, and their granting form is, is really quite small. So it isn't arduous at all. Uh, I know that for some of the government, pseudo government, uh, it can be very, very, very beefy <laughs> in terms of the application process. They may want a logic model. Uh, they want certainly uh, outcome measures, right? These types of things. Whereas on your uh, community foundations, it would be more, uh, I, I've actually given stories and pictures to community foundations in some of my applications. Um, any chance you can, if there is a way to phone up or contact the funder first, please do. Mm. Please, please do. Um, that is a, a great way to sort of differentiate yourself. So it doesn't look like you're just doing sort of a shotgun of sending out 50 applications and hoping somebody picks it up, but you can actually chat with somebody on the other end. Uh, and they might be able to, you know, give you some fantastic information such as, oh, you know, this, um, in this session, this, uh, sort of, uh, session of our granting process, uh, we are fo focusing more on X. Oh, wow. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you very much. Oh, Derek, if you are submitting for this, please ensure that you show why. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you, right? Um, it is so critical to try and phone up and connect with them and build that relationship beforehand if you can. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I think kind of piggybacking off of that, I think this will probably be our last question too. Um, but what are your thoughts um, on cold calls? I'm guessing this maybe applies more towards individual donors, but um, yeah. Um, myself, I'm, I am, myself, I'm very, very much against it. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I am against it is because the shops that I've mostly been at is, is uh, I was the lone fundraiser mm -hmm. and thus uh, cold calling the ROI just was not there. I would rather uh, deal with Betty Sue uh, that had donated $50 uh, each year for the past 15 years than trying, you know, contact, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Sunny Jim uh, and, 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 you know, who's out of the blue, right? Mm -hmm. Um you saw how many charities there are. Uh, they have a lot to choose from. I do not find the cold calling. That's why I think Rosso's concentric circles really come back to those first principles, right? Mm -hmm. Who is it that we can sort of go after and those closest to you, I think will count. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. And thanks everyone else for um, sticking around and taking the time uh, to get all this great information and letting us tell you about our other workshops coming up. So yeah, uh, as a reminder, um, I will be sending out this recording as soon as it's ready. Um, and in a few hours or minutes, you'll get the slides as well. So um, thank you everyone for attending and uh, we'll see you later. Thanks everyone. Really appreciate it.